So this episode is sponsored by Pledge. Okay, number three. We're not. Pledge boy. Um, yeah. yeah, number three. Yeah. So I just did. So I did. Uh, I hopped the horse. Don't. No. Don't. Okay. Don't. Walk. I found force to find acceleration. No. Okay. okay. On number three, here's the deal. You can't use F equals MA on a compressed spring because as it, that force changes, because as that spring decompresses, it's, a, it's applying a variable amount of force, right? That's why you can't do F equals MA. But what you can do is that when you're doing work and you're compressing that spring, what type of energy are you storing? Yeah, you're storing us, right? When you release it, what happens to all of that us? It turns into kinetic energy. So you have one half kx squared equaling one half mv squared. And you solve the d. You have K. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, don't, you can't, don't do F equals MA with a compressed spring. Because as it, like with that spring, as it decompresses, it's, it's, you're getting a small, you're getting a different amount of acceleration because there's less and less force. Gotcha. So that's why you can't do that. Huh? Yeah. Somewhere between two and five meters per second. Uh, on number four, every answer on number four should start with a four. Yes. Okay, I'm okay. And if four A is wrong, everything is going to be wrong. So your answer to four A should be 40 radians per second squared. Okay? Because literally, if that starts wrong, everything is going to be wrong. Okay? Uh, now, because on that one, you got to use, usually what happens there is that you use the wrong, like, moment of inertia because of the fact that it's a cell enduring. You've got to use one half mr squared and not mr squared. Now, let's talk about the answer to number 10. Okay? So, in number 10, you're trying to find the center mass of the Earth and Moon. So, here's the Earth, okay? Here's the Moon. And we're going out here like this. So you're going to use center of mass equals x1 m1 plus x2 m2 over the sum of the masses. So if you're clever, and you are, what are you going to let the initial position of the Earth be? Zero. Zero. Okay? Make that zero. So it's like we're pivoting around this point. So this becomes zero. Then you know how far it is out to the moon. You get x2 divided by the sum of the mass. So your answer to number 10 should start with the 4 and be something times 10 to the 6th. Okay? Now, let me explain the significance of this number. What that means, because the radius of arrows is like 6.37 times 10 to the, to the 6th. So what that means is the center mass of the, of the Earth-Moon system actually resides within the Earth itself. Okay? Now, let me explain the significance of this in terms of a bigger orbital picture. So if I said, if I gave each of you a quiz, and I said, here's the sun, and here's the earth, okay? And if I said, draw the orbital path of the moon around the earth, what would you draw? The going, he's going to draw something like this, right? Yeah. Be a circle going around, right? Everybody cool with this. So you all would draw. All of you are completely wrong. Okay? And you're sitting and go, whoa, 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 Burkham, this is what we've been taught, is that moon or zero. I'm not disputing that. But here's the, here's the significance. So, great, come here. Okay. So, I'm going to be the Earth, and Grape's going to be, turn that over. Sorry, give us, give us a little shot. Okay. So, well, grapes, I'm the Earth, grapes going to be the moon. Okay? Now, so he's going to orbit me, but here's the cool thing. Eh, no, no, no. Okay. 
So here's the cool thing about when the moon orbits the Earth. The moon is what we call tidally locked to the Earth. What that means is that at the same side of the moon is always facing us. Okay, so like we never saw what was on the other side of the moon until the Apollo 8 missions, which was the first people to orbit around the moon. So the Apollo 8 missions was cool because they were the few, first human beings that have ever lived that saw what was on the other side of the moon. It doesn't mean that it's the dark side. It just means that it's the opposite side. So when you go around me, I've got it. I'm, I'm the Earth. You're, you're, the same side of you is always going to face me. Okay, so make that happen. Okay? So I'm the Earth. I'm spinning. Right? Okay? He's going around like this. Now, even though the same side is facing me, are you spinning on your axis? Yeah, because if he wasn't spinning on his axis, what would happen? So if you if you walk around and you don't spin, what what do that? Okay, I just need you to walk around, right, and without spinning, right? So I wouldn't see the same side all the time. Well, if if you make this side, right? So he's got to spin on its axis because of the fact that if he doesn't, like, without you spinning, what that would mean like the same side that he would always face the wall, okay? But the same side is always going to be facing me, so it's tidally locked. Now, this is with it, me being stationary. But is the Earth stationary at, throughout, like, the, the, the course of a lunar phase? No. What's the Earth doing? Why is it here? We're moving, right? Now, I want you to try to do the same thing in a circular orbit as I move. Okay? All right? You ready? Okay. Cut you off here. Yeah. Now, now what? Catch back up. Yeah. Now you got to race to catch back up. Yeah. Right. So if you just try and walk around in a normal circle while I'm moving, it becomes exponentially more difficult because then it's like, oh, I got to catch up. Okay. And then he's going to go around me while I'm keeping on going. So then he's got to run out even faster to catch up, and then it just becomes this big first, you know. Horrible thing, and you would be speeding up and slowing down all the time, right? Now, well done. Thank you. Give it up for Greg. Okay. So here's what I want to look at. Okay. Let's go, Matt. Shut up, Matt. So here's the Earth. So let's say uh, about a week ago, on November 23rd, we had a full moon. Okay. So where is the moon on November 23rd? Full moon. On the opposite side. Over here? Yeah. Because that way we're looking, we're seeing the dark side of the moon is facing away from us. Now, here's what I want you to think through. How many days does it take for the Earth to orbit around the sun? You know, 65 days. How many degrees are in a circle? 360. So each day, how far does the Earth move? About a degree. Okay? We move about a degree every day as we orbit around our star. So here we are on November 23rd. So on December 23rd, guess what? We're going to move about 23 degrees in this orbit. Okay? So we're going to go from here, and we're going to move up about 23 degrees, because we're not stationary. We're moving around our star. So where's the moon going to be on the next full moon? Same place out there, right? So the moon's going to be, well, God, I hate it when that happens. Oh, it's showing great. It's working. No. Why not? Okay, so technically, we never get a full moon. We only get half the moon. We're only seeing one side of it. Right? <laughs> no. You're seeing a full lit side of the moon. That's we only see a full lit side. Yes. Now, trying to be sciencey, but just being in between here. So this is that's December 23rd. Okay. The moon's going to be over here. So, halfway in between, we're going to, what, what phase is the moon going to be in? So, we're going to go full moon here, full moon here. What's going to happen in between? Is it dark? The dark side of the moon, otherwise known as a new moon. Okay, right? So, in about two weeks, we're going to have a new moon. So, here we're going to have a new moon. So here's what happens. This actually goes in a sinusoidal curve around the Earth. 
Okay? So it isn't like the Earth is stationary and you're going around like this. So what's happening, so imagine me walking and Grape actually walking in a sinusoidal curve like this. So he's always moving forward. So he's always moving. So he's always moving in this direction to keep up with the Earth. But during that time, he's also got a, a, a change in this position so that it appears that he orbits. Now, if the moon just stayed out here at one point, okay, if the moon always stayed, like let's say, for example, we stop the moon. Okay, hey, we always have a full moon. Okay, kind of cool. But then it would just be locked in that point going around like this. So here's the significance of where that center of mass is located. Because that center of mass is located inside the Earth, that's the point that we actually orbit around. Okay? So that means that this center of mass is what's actually tracking around this orbit. So here's how life would change. If that center of mass was actually between the moon and the Earth, like outside of us, like halfway in between, what would happen is that these orbits then would become much more complex. Because then, it would, then we would actually be going like in a figure eight. So then we would be orbiting around that center of mass as it goes around like this. And our orbits, and it wouldn't be this nice little circular orbit. It would be completely much more complex as it went around there. Because it's still going to orbit around that center of mass. Okay? So it's a good thing that our center of mass is inside the Earth and not outside. I mean, it would still work. But our orbits would just much, be much more complex. Okay. Your answer to number one should be around one. That's just a simple momentum problem. Momentum of Timmy in the boat plus the momentum of the rock equals new momentum of Timmy plus the new momentum of the rock. So that's an absolute value of one, by the way. Could be positive, could be negative, depending on how you set it up. Uh, on number eight, excuse me, on seven and eight, on seven and eight, this is an ish. On seven and eight, all of your answers should be around two. Okay, but that's an ish. Okay, but it's it's a decent ish. Okay, big ish. Big ish. All right. Anything else? Going what? Michael. Um, number eleven. All you're gonna do is just use this. X1, M1 plus X2, M2 divided by the sum of the masses. Okay? But here's what you have to be careful of on that one, Michael. These distances have to be measured from, like, that origin. That isn't how far apart they are from each other. The distances have to go back to that original point. Okay? Yeah, so you're just using that equation right there. And your answer to number 11 should be, and this is an ish, around 0.5. You can live with that? I can look at that. Number okay. 11. Oh, okay. All right. Anything else? Once, twice, sold. Got it. Get done, done, right? Huh? It doesn't take too long to get done, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It looks bad. Huh? You have fun writing those stories. I do. Yeah. I do. If I didn't, I wouldn't teach. So, you know. But it's tough love, you know? And this is what I'll tell everybody. I could make this the easiest class in the entire world. I really could. I could give you two or three simple assignments, problems every night. It would make it easy for me to grade, and we could do that. And guess what? I would be doing you a disservice. Because I know the road that's gonna, that you're going to face going to bed. That's why I'm a jerk. So, okay. As a matter of fact, I got a text yesterday from one of my former students. That, University of Texas in Austin, she's going, I would be so completely screwed if I hadn't hit you for silence. So, yeah. So, you'll All right, now here's the question. Is it possible to have rotational energy without translational energy? Olivia. No. Why not? You're right, but that wasn't the question. So 
So here's my question. Can I make this wheel just have rotational energy without making it move? Like without the wheel itself yes. going moving along the line? Yeah. So if I do this, right, I have rotational energy, but it's not going anywhere. So clearly there's some energy going on here, right? And if I want to stop it, I've got to apply a torque, you know, all this good stuff. Now, is it possible for this wheel to have translational energy without rotational energy? I mean, yes, if it's... Yeah, if I just throw it, yeah. okay? Yeah. Right? And nothing's spinning, it would just have translational energy. Yeah. So I can have rotational energy, okay, with no translational. I can have translational without any rotational. But can I have both at the same time? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if I take this wheel and I roll with it along, I'm going to have both forms at the same time. I'm going to have rotational and translational energy taking place at the exact same time, right? So here's what I want to look at. So I'm going to take this one kilogram mass and I'm going to roll it along here. So as that rolls, does it have both types of energy? Yes. Yeah. So I want to find the total energy that this thing is going to have. So that total amount of energy is going to be kT plus kR. So let's say that it is a one kilogram mass, and it's moving at, say, I don't know, four meters per second. So I've got one kilogram mass and it's moving on at four meters per second. So I want to figure out what's the total rotational energy, or the translational and the rotational energy. So the KT is easy. So what do I have to have to calculate KT? I need two things. Mass and velocity. Yeah, so that's just going to be one half mv squared, right? So of the two energies, Kinetic energy is always the easiest one to find because it's just mass times velocity, okay? It's easy to measure velocity. It's easy to determine mass. Of the two, this is always the simplest form of energy to determine. Now, KR is more complicated because that's one-half I R omega squared, right? So just by virtue of the fact that that's I, why does that make it more complicated? Because you have to calculate that. Yeah. You don't know, you have to figure out what the object is. If it's a thin hoop, that's mr squared. If it's a hollow sphere, it's two-thirds mr squared. If it's a solid sphere, it's two-fifths mr squared. Okay? So there's a whole bunch of different ways that this plays out, depending upon the shape of the object, where the mass, what the mass is, and where that radius is. Now, even this is difficult to measure, because it isn't like, oh, you know, I'll just look at it and see, get an idea of how many radians per second it's spinning. No. Okay, if this thing is moving, measuring your linear velocity is simple. Hey, I'll take a stopwatch. I'll measure how far it goes while it's rolling and divide that by the time and, oh, hey, boom, I've got my linear velocity. To try and measure omega is tough because of the fact that that's in radians per second. So this is the grave here. This one's tough to pull off. But we're going to get clever. Okay, we're going to get clever. So this is still one half mv squared, okay, plus one half. Now, because it's a solid cylinder, how do you calculate the moment of inertia of a solid cylinder? Barry. Uh, one half mr squared. Beautiful. Okay, so that's going to be one half mr squared. Now, I want you to be very, very careful about something. This one half out here is part of the equation. This one half in here is part of the moment of inertia calculation. So these two one halves, even though they're the same one half, they're not the same one half, if that makes sense. So this one half will always be out here. This could change. If it's a thin hoop, it's mr squared. If it's a hollow sphere, it's 2 thirds mr squared. Okay? So this fraction in here will change depending upon the shape. This one half out there, that's just what it is. It's just one half. Okay. Now, let's talk about omega. 
doing it. Man, it'll make it tough to do. It's tough, man. But I know that V equals R omega. Oh. So Michael, if I got V equals R omega, how can I get omega by itself? Um, divide by R. Beautiful. Divide by R. Okay? So then could I take V over R and substitute that in for omega? Yeah. Oh, that will square that. That's kind of cool. So I get V squared over R squared. So at this point, what's going to happen? Oh, I want to cancel out my R squared. Okay? Now, here's the beauty of this. This, this problem like this is the quintessential example of why you work with variables and then at the last step you put in numbers. I know you all want to put numbers in. You want to calculate this. Oh, I've got mass and I've got velocity. Oh, Mr. Burkham, I calculate kinetic energy. Good on you, okay? But don't, okay? Look at this entire equation because this is the beauty of what happens when you work with variables. You see a, a deeper hidden truth. So, look what happens here. If I take one half times a half, I should get one fourth. One fourth. My r squared cancels out, so I've got one fourth m v squared plus one half m v squared. So if I take one half m v squared plus one fourth m v squared, I get three fourths m v squared. Okay. So this becomes much simpler than going through and finding omega by itself and then squaring that, and then finding your moment of inertia by itself, and then you get that number, and it's just whole, you could do it, but it's just a train wreck, okay? If you work this whole thing with variables, you see that so much of it simplifies out. So, notice when I started this problem, I never gave you the radius, why? You don't need it. Even though it's spinning, I don't need the radius. So the cool thing about that is that if you have one kilogram mass, no matter, as long as it's a solid cylinder, no matter how big it is, you're still going to get the same answer, okay? As long as the mass stays the same. So in this situation, somebody take uh, four squared and <coughs> multiply that by three fourths. Twenty-four. Twelve. 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 So I got 12 joules of energy. So if this thing is rolling at 4 meters per second, the total energy is going to be 12 joules. Now, how much energy would it have if it was just moving at 4 meters per second? Well, if it was just moving, right, that would be 4 squared, which would be 16. 16, half of that is going to be 8, mass is 1 kilogram. So if it's just moving, without rotating, it would have 8 joules of energy. But since it's moving and spinning, I got a total of 12 joules of energy. Now, if I wanted to, if I wanted to, let's say that that radius is, uh, I don't know, uh, 0.025 meters, okay? Which is about 2.5 centimeters, which is about like yay. Okay? I'm going to ballpark it. If I wanted to, if I actually had that radius, I could come in here and actually calculate the moment of inertia. I could actually calculate omega by taking 4 and dividing it by 0 0.25, 0 0.025. I could do all that if I wanted to, but you don't. So if you just know this and you're finding that energy, this is what you end up with. Now, here's a huge caveat that goes with this. Okay? I want you to be very careful. Don't sit here and go, oh, I'll just memorize this for the test, and the total kinetic energy of any rotating object is always going to be 3 fourths m mv squared. And I'll just memorize that for the test. This only works because of the fact that this is a solid cylinder. If this had been like a sphere, a solid sphere, this would be 2 fifths mr squared. If it was a hollow sphere, it would be 2 thirds mr squared. If it was a thin hoop, it would just be mr squared. So this only works, okay, you, where you get 3 quarter m, mv squared, that only works because of the fact that it's a solid cylinder. 
If it's anything else, you're going to get a different fraction in there. Okay? You're going to get a different fraction. Hunter, but we can still use it. Yeah, you can still use 3 fourths MV squared for all solid cylinders? Yes. Okay. Yes, that yeah. works as long as it's a solid cylinder. Yeah. But here's what's important. The only thing that changes out of this entire process is this. Okay? Think through the process. Don't get hung up on memorizing something. Yeah. Okay? Literally, the only thing that you change in this process is this part right here. And then that's going to determine what happens down here. So, maybe get to this point, but if you think it through, you're going to be much better off than trying to memorize something. Okay? Good with that. Now, let's kind of tie a whole bunch of different things together. I've got to move over there. Some magic, 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 magic. Oh boy. Okay. All right, so up here, I've got a round disc, and if I let go of it, whoa, it rolls. You're fine. Okay. If I let it go like this, it goes straight down. If I hold it horizontal, you can even push it that way. Whoa. So this is just one very, very, very strong magnet. Okay? You just do that all day. That just kind of gets on. Okay. <laughs> like a cat. Yeah, kind of. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. So here's my question. So let's say that this thing has a mass of, uh, I don't know, 0.25 kilograms. And let's say that the distance between here is about a meter. Okay? All right. So does this thing have potential energy? Yes. 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 And Olivia, how can I calculate that amount of potential energy? Beautiful. So my UG, right, would be MGH. So somebody take 0.25 kilograms times G times one meter. 2.45 joules, right? Now I want to look at two situations. Situation number one, I'm just going to hold it up here and I'm just going to let it fall straight down. I've just got it here, boink, let go. Oh, no. Okay, right? It's okay. And it falls straight down. So if it just falls, Straight down. I write it. I'm delivering from Mrs. Fisher. She said you might like to try one. Does it involve chocolate? No, but it's a cricket. <laughs> <laughs> she made us walk it all the way down here. Okay. I've eaten fried mopani worms in Africa. I'm not touching crickets. <gasps> Ew. Good. Good. I'm happy for you. Good for you, Ryan. He cursed us. No, we didn't. We went I all the way down here. <laughs> I, I'm not eating fried crickets. The <laughs> this is the future. This is the future protein. I'm happy for you. All star. Be dead by the end. If that's the future, I'm okay. I've had a good run. Okay. So if, if I just drop it, okay? If I just drop it, how much kinetic energy is it going to have when it hits the box? Two point four five two point. Because this is this is all I've got, right? Yeah. So my kinetic energy at the bottom, and if you want to set up a cool chart, okay, which you could, and I'd highly recommend that. So we got UG, and we've got KT, and we've got the sum, right? So up at the top, that was 2.45 joules. That means my sum is 2.54 joules, right? So then how fast, how can I figure out how fast it's going at the bottom? Nick, what could I do? Hmm? What can I do? I know that's how much energy that I've got. This is going to equal the kinetic energy to the bottom. Okay? So my kinetic energy is going to be 2.45 joules. So how can I get my velocity from knowing that number? What is kinetic energy equal, Nick? How do you calculate kinetic energy? Um, one half mv squared. One half mv squared. You know the mass? No. Oh wait, yes, okay. 
<laughs> you know how much kinetic energy you got, so how are you going to get V by itself? Uh, there'd be 2 carried, whatever the energy is, divided by 2 M. Yeah, well, no, no, no. just multiply by 2 and then just divide by yeah. M. Yes. So my velocity is going to be 2 times my kinetic energy divided by mass. So somebody take 2 times 2.45 joules and divide that by 0.25 kilograms. 4.43. Ooh, she already right. tapped over there. Yeah, she's sitting there. Okay, that's cool, right? So, that's if I take this thing, right, I just hold it up, and I just drop it, and I let it fall. Everybody cool with that? Now, I'm going to take this. <laughs> this thing is theoretically capable of like lifting like 150 pounds. Okay. Um, so if I let go of it low yes. and let it roll, oh, that was a broken phone. Huh? Someone broke someone's phone. I don't. I thought. Yeah. You better stay away. So I got it up here and I let go of it. It's not mine, so I'm not worried. So now when it rolls, now what types of energy does it have? Rotational, Rotational. kinetic. Energy. Oh. But do I still start with the same kind of arc? Yes. Okay. So we're going to get a little clever and go, okay, well now that UG is going to equal what? KT plus KR. Ah, that would be clever. Now, let me just say that UG is MGH, which hopefully it still is. And KT is going to be 1 half MV squared. And this is going to be one half i omega squared, All right? Okay. So this is the process that we've got going. But again, here's where we're going to get clever. As this thing rolls, it's going to be pretty difficult to measure omega. Okay. That's going to be tough to pull off. Butter omega. Same thing. Uh, where have I been? I don't know. <laughs> So here's the deal. So what I want to do is the same thing that I did up there. So this looks surprisingly like what shape? Solid. Oh, a solid cylinder. Oh, how cool is that, right? <laughs> so since that's a solid cylinder, instead of I, I can put one half mr squared. One half mr squared. And instead of but squared, I can put v squared v over r squared. Oh, v squared over r squared. Oh, how cool is that? So now what's going to happen? Your r is oh, three fourths m v squared. So I get m g h equals one half m v squared plus one fourth one fourth m v squared. So now what can I do to simplify this even more? Well, I could add, okay, I could add it again. And then divide. And get three fourths. Get rid of the mass. M V squared equals. Yeah. M G H is out. Mass cancels out. Oh, mass cancel out. That's kind of cool. Oops. So then I get V equals the square root of what? G H over. Yeah, four thirds G H. Yeah, let's do four thirds because I hate fractions. Okay, we'll multiply by that reciprocal. Four thirds GH. Now, here's what's clever about this. But don't don't anybody touch calculate. Do not calculate this number. Do not calculate this number. Mary. Mary. Okay. Okay, it's in the air. Step away from the calculator. Before you do any calculations at all, do you think this velocity that you're gonna get here? when it's rolling, it's going to be bigger, smaller, or equal to 4.4 thirds, or 4.43 meters per second. 4.43. Why? Because you still have the same amount of energy. I still have the same amount of energy, so I should still get the exact same velocity. Everybody cool with that thought process? Yeah. Yeah? Is this, okay. Are you going to prove us wrong? Huh? Are you going to prove us wrong? That's not my job. 
Wait, are we right? No. <laughs> okay, so now, Mary, because I know you're dying to, take four thirds times G times one meter. 3.61. 3.61 meters per second. So why is that less? What'd you say, Bonnie? What'd you say? Well, it's going slow, right? Yeah. Well, why is it all slow? I don't know. Uh, oh. Okay. When we did this calculation, what's the only type of energy that we ended up with? Kinetic. Kinetic. You're right. We still have 2.45 joules of energy to work with. But, so this is just if we drop it. If it rolls, then we've still got to, we still only have 2.45 joules of energy. Okay? So that sum is still the same. I still only have 2.45 joules of energy. But now I've got to split that between translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. Okay? So now it's kind of like your long lost aunt. She passes away, and if this is a situation where you are her only heir, okay? You are the only nephew or niece that this woman has, and she leaves all of her money to you. You get the full thing, okay? This situation, you've got a brother that you have to split the money with, okay? <laughs> Same money, but you got to split it, okay? So you can't buy quite as fast a car because you got to split the money with your brother. Oh, I'm the favorite child. I'm not, I, I, this isn't about being a favorite, okay? She's your long lost, and you don't know her. It's just now. Okay, go with the story, okay? Go with the story. So, this is less because I still have the same amount of energy, but I'm splitting it between the two. Now, I want you to think about this. Okay, situation number one, I'm going to let it roll down at a pretty steep angle, okay? Situation number two, I'm going to let it roll, but it's going to be at a more gradual angle. So here's the question. In which situation In which situation are you going to end up with a higher velocity? When it rolls at a steeper angle, when it rolls at a more gradual angle, or is it just going to be the same? It rolls when it rolls steeper. 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 Steeper? Because it was a higher velocity when we just went straight down. Wait, does it? It was lower when we went below. I think it should. Straight down. Stop, 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 stop. 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 Stop, What is the only number that you plugged into here? Height. The height. Yeah. Did the steepness and the angle play a factor in this equation? Oh, no. no. So as long as it's rolling, guess what? You still end up at 3.61 meters per second. Okay? You still end up at the exact same velocity. Now, don't confuse that with holding it here and dropping it. I'm dropping it because that means that it's all translational and there's no rotation. Okay? Now, even if I pull it up here like this and I let it roll down, I'm still going to end up at 3.61 meters per second because I still have the same amount of energy that I'm splitting between rotational and kinetic energy. So if I hold it up here like this, and even if, you know, at a angle like this, Okay. It's going to take longer to get there. It's going to travel a greater distance, but the acceleration won't be as much. So I've got a longer time, a smaller acceleration, but I still end up with the exact same velocity. Okay. So this is what you have to look at. What's a factor and what's not a factor. Now, again, don't sit here and go, oh, I'll memorize this for the test. This only works with solid cylinders. 
If this was Hank the bowling ball that I had up here, this would become two-fifths two mr squared. If it was a tennis ball that was rolling down, it would be two-thirds mr squared. So again, understand the process. Don't memorize this, okay? Think through the process. Now, knowing this, 3.61 meters per second, what could I do with that in terms of, at that point, could I calculate my translational kinetic energy? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you can find your rotational. Oh, right? Because I've still got 2.45 joules of energy. True? So I've got 2.45 joules of energy. So that's got to get split between KR and KT. KT. Which one of these is going to be easier to calculate at this point? KT. KT. So this is going to be one half mass, which is 0.25 kilograms, times 3.61 meters per second squared. So sort of take one half times 0.25 times 3.61 squared. I say someone, that narrows it down to Greg or Mary. 0.451. 0.451? Is that true? I think. As far as that, that seems small. It could be right, but it just seems small. Check the order. You know, I bet if I would have plugged that one. I got 1.63. Yeah, we would I got 1.630. I didn't square it. 1.63? Oh. Oh, no, 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 no. 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 1.63. So then how much rotational kinetic energy do I have? Just whatever 2.45 minus that is. Yeah, so somebody take 2.45 minus 1.63. 0 0.82. Now, knowing this, okay, now you can do now you can do a whole bunch of stuff with this. So now you can sit here and go, okay, hey, that's equal to one half i omega squared, right? So if you knew the radius of this, okay, so let's say that radius is point is two and a half centimeters, right? So if that radius is two and a half centimeters, then I can sit here and go, that's one half, one half my mass times 0.25 kilograms times 0.025 meters squared times butt squared, okay? So I can solve for butt if I wanted to. Now here's the cool thing if you wanted to. Since you know this and you know the radius, you could actually get omega. Okay, so this is how you could actually solve for the moment of inertia. So if you know how much energy that you have, and if you find your butt, so to speak, then you can solve for I, then you can figure out what that moment of inertia should be, and you can compare that to like a theoretical value. Because once you get V, then you can do a whole bunch of stuff with it. So, promise you, promise you, promise you on the test on Tuesday, there's going to be a problem like this. You mark my words, okay? There's going to be a problem like this. But don't memorize, oh, it's four-thirds GH, because what are the odds that I'm going to make this a solid cylinder? One Zero. Okay? It's going to be something else. But you understand the process, right? We're good? Okay. What? Um, so how did we, what, where do we get the 4.43, or why is 4.43 different from the like 3.61? Because the 4.43 is if it was just completely dropped. Oh, just dropped. Just dropped. Oh, okay. And we had no rotational energy. Okay. This is you being the only child of your long lost aunt. Okay. This is you splitting the money with your sibling. Okay, you can't buy as fast a car because you don't have as much energy. Right. Got it? Or let him buy a car and then you kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you have to go that way? Huh? Come on, Ken. Come on, Mr. Fry. Jeez. <laughs> Can't you at least just threaten him and start killing him? So is this first? why there's so many parts on the okay, saltboard? Huh? Is that why there's so many parts on the saltboard? Because you can do all different stuff. Yeah. Then? Okay. Kim, do you want his attention? <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> okay. So we got one last thing to go. What can administrators do to teachers?
Fire. 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 <laughs> well, yeah, I feel like you have to run that through somebody higher up. Yeah. To get fired as a teacher, do you have to go like, like on trial, like the board trial things? You know what I'm talking about? It depends on what you do. And yeah, it depends upon. There's a couple of factors. Like Bert, to get you fired, how would we go about it? Yeah, I wouldn't have. It. Like, just for notes. <laughs> just just wonder. Every day. No, no. <laughs> I, I would have to do something pretty, pretty. I'd have to screw up really, really bad. Like physically, like rip his head off in class. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, that's, I think that'd be worth it. Dude, I can edit that in a video. <laughs> Get on it. Okay. Okay. It was the worst that could happen. I gotta go back to Africa and teach. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's say, let's say that I want to make this wheel spin. So right now, does it have a moment of inertia? Yes, why? As mass and it has radius. radius. Okay, so I've got a moment of inertia, kind of cool. If I want to make it spin, what do I have to apply? A force. A force, and that force has to act over a distance. distance. Now. If it's linear work, okay, and this is something that you need to keep track of. If it's linear work, okay, if it's linear work, work equals force times distance, right? Newtons times meters, you get joules. True? Now, here's here's the one thing that's, that you need to think through with work, okay? You can do work under constant velocity, and you can do work with changing kinetic energy. So if done. I take this and I push it along at a constant velocity, I'm doing work because I'm exerting a force through a distance. But I'm not changing the kinetic energy of it. Okay? So in one situation, I can do work, constant force over a distance, there's no change in the kinetic energy. Or I could take this thing and I could throw it up in the air. Now, if I throw it up in the air, am I also doing work? Because in that situation, I'm making it accelerate because I'm exerting a force through a distance. So work can work in, no pun intended, work can work in two different ways. Work can work under constant velocity, or work can work in changing the kinetic energy, okay? Depending upon which side of the work coin that you're, that you're looking at. Constant velocity or changing energy. So. If I take this wheel, let's say that I apply a torque, right? Because I got to apply a torque because I have to apply a force at some point away from the center. Situation number one, I apply a force over a very short number of radians, okay? Just through a little bit. Situation number two, I apply that same torque over a much greater number of radians. In which case did I do more work? Second one, in which case do you think I changed the kinetic energy of the wheel more? The, the first one or the second one? The second one. Second one. Oh, so in rotational work, this is linear. Work in a rotational problem. Now, stay with me here. Hold on. Wrong letter. Work in rotational is torque theta. Now let's talk about this. Okay? This is torque theta. So if you think about it, the more torque that I apply, the more work that I'm going to do. The bigger theta is, however many radians it moves through, the more work that I'm going to do. So if you look at the units, okay, this is where the units play into this deal. What units is torque measured in? Newton meters, right? Because it's force times radius. So this is Newton meters. Oh. <laughs> that was a groan or what, man? So theta is going to be measured in what? Radius. Radius, but that's a dimensionless number. Yeah. It just clicks. Oh, so you get Newton meters, otherwise known as? Joules. Joules. Everything makes sense now. Everything makes sense. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I can leave the class now. Everything. We're good? We're good. You, 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 you have, have successfully done your job. He can now prove street theory. 
I dream in physics. I dream in radiance. I dream in radiance. That should be the name of like a sitcom. I dream in radiance. Okay. Big Bang Theory can do some about birds. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So now let's talk. What I did work. What else did I change? Somebody said it. Well, not the velocity, but the kinetic energy. What type of kinetic energy? Rotational. Rotational kinetic energy. So work also equals delta kr. Oh, that's kind of cool, right? So we can write this a whole bunch of different ways. We could go kr minus kr naught. Okay? We could have one half i times butt squared minus butt not squared. Okay? We tried this a whole squared, bunch of different ways. Not squared. Okay? Now, butt r squared. No, it's not. Butt r round. Okay. <laughs> so, let's talk power. At the end of the day, what does power equalize? Now, that's the units. Oh. Right. Uh, work, work, work over time. time. Work over time. Oh, so on rotational, power is still going to equal work over time, right? But again, we could write this a couple of different ways. We could write this as change in rotational energy over time. Okay, we could write it that way because that's going to be joules per second, otherwise known as watts. Okay. Now, we could also write that as we said work, right? In a rotational sense, was torque theta. So we could write that as torque theta over time. Now, think about this. If it's spinning at a constant velocity, how, what's another way that we can write theta over time? Radians per second. Well, what if this was distance over time? Be velocity. Since it's theta over time, it's but it's angular velocity, right? So power can also be written as torque button. Yes? <laughs> I'm just saying. Because that's joules times radians per second. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can look at power. <laughs> it just depends on the situation. It just depends on the situation. Okay, and Max? Max, did you take this out? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me get you started on problem number two. Okay? Wait. Yes, it has a lot of parts. There's so many. I can't even count that. Out. So, here's this pendulum, and it's going to swing down, and then this is like a golf shot. And there's another piece of clay here, and they're going to hit, and they're going to swing off. And they're going to move over here, okay? And what you're ultimately finding is this angle, okay? So let me get you started. So this pendulum is already moving, okay? It's already moving, so anytime you're moving, what type of energy do you have? KG. You have some kinetic energy, right? You also have UG because of the fact that it's above the ground and it can fall, right? So you have some translational kinetic energy because it's moving, and you have rotational, and you have UG because it's above. Now, it isn't spinning on its axis, so we don't have to worry about KR on this problem. We just have to worry about KT. Now, the trick here is that you've got to figure out how high above the plane this thing is. So here's what you want to look at. I've given you this equation. That's y equals L times 1 minus cosine theta. So this is not angular momentum. This is the length of the pendulum. Okay? You couldn't calculate angular momentum if you tried on this problem. You don't have enough information. So this is going to be like 1 and a half meters. If the angle is 60 degrees, you're going to figure out how high it is before it's going to fall. Now, just like when I was rolling that magnet down, the path that it takes doesn't make any difference as long as it takes, as long as you end up with the same thing. So what you want to look at is that once you find this, 
you can figure out how far it's going to fall, and then you can figure out how fast it's going down here. So think this through. Up here, what two types of energy does it have? It has UG and it has some initial amount of kinetic energy because it's moving like 1.2 meters per second. Okay? When it gets here, what's the only type of energy that it has? Kinetic. KT, right? Which is going to be 1 half mv squared. So if you're clever, you're going to set mgh plus 1 half mv naught squared equal to 1 half mv squared. And if you're clever and you simplify it far enough, what, are you, what equation are you going to end up with? That equation. You're going to end up with that equation. So to find the velocity of the ball as it hits the bottom, just use that equation. But you, you have to use this to figure out how far it's going to fall. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now because if your answer to 2C is wrong, everything else is going to be wrong. So your answer to 2C should just be a tiny bit above 4 meters per second, okay? Because if that is wrong, everything else on 2C is going to be wrong. So here's what's going to happen. It's going to come down here. It's going to hit this other piece of clay, and they're going to do the California thing, and they're going to move off together. So which quantity is always conserved in a collision? Mechanical energy or momentum? Momentum. Momentum is always conserved. Mechanical energy can change forms. So to find the velocity after they hit and move off, do a momentum problem. You're going to know how fast this is going. You're going to know the combined mass. You're going to figure out how fast it's going afterwards. You're also going to figure out how much energy they two have. Now, once you know how much energy that it has, guess what? That's going to equal the energy that it has stored as potential energy up at the top of the pendulum, okay? So you're going to go from here to here. So there's a couple of different ways that you can work this problem. But no matter what, you've got to figure out how high those two swing up together. You have to get that number. Because what you're ultimately going to do is that you're going to, go, you're going to circle back to this equation. The length of the pendulum is still one and a half meters. You're going to figure out how high they go when they move off together. And you're going to know, and you're going to isolate this angle. So at the end of the day, you're going to go back to this equation, divide by L, add that over, isolate that variable, take the inverse cosine. If all goes well, your answer on that angle, uh, when it says what's the maximum angle to which the combined masses can be swing, especially from the vertical, should be in the mid 40s. Okay, so if all goes well, that should end up in the mid 40s. Now, let's talk about number four. So, number four is the satellite problem. So, all you have to do is just go to any former student and go, oh, we got the satellite problem. I'm going to go, oh, I remember that. So, here's the deal when satellites are deployed, they're not spinning. Okay? And that's a problem. So if this is a satellite and you're, in the, and you're outside of the confines of this magnetic field and atmosphere that we have, bad things happen. Like you are bombarded with cosmic rays, high energy particles, bad things. So if you just have the satellite orbiting and you have the same side always facing the sun without an atmosphere or any type of radiation, what's going to happen is that one side is going to get really, really, really hot because it's absorbing that thermal energy. The other side's going to be in the vacuum of space and get really, 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 really cold. So you're going to have one side that's really, really hot, and you have another side that's basically an absolute zero. That sucks for electronic components. So what you want to do is you want to get it to spin in what's called the barbecue rule. Barbecue roll, excuse me. So it's kind of like a rotisserie chicken. If you've ever seen a chicken cooking, okay, this is what you do with a satellite. So you have to get this thing spinning so that you get an even heating all the way around so that one side doesn't get really, really hot and the other side doesn't get really, really cold. So this is the actual real life application. So to make these spin, you typically have rockets that are located on the outside of the satellite. You're going to fire these rockets and that's going to make this thing begin to spin. So what you've got to figure out is how are we going to do this. 
So, it's a solid cylinder satellite. So what are you going to use for the moment of inertia? One half mr squared. Square. So what you're going to do is you're going to start off using torque equals I alpha, which equals force times radius. But the trick is you have to find alpha. You have to figure out the angular acceleration. So what do you think the initial angular rate of spin is for this satellite? Zero. Zero. You're going to end up spinning at 32 revolutions per minute. So what are you going to do with revolutions per minute? Change, to Change that into radians per, per radians per second. And then you can divide that by the time and get your angular acceleration. So that first answer on 4A, the angular acceleration of the rocket, should be a really small number, like 0, 0.0 something. Okay? It's going to be a really, really, really small number. Now, the, on number four, you're going to tie a whole bunch of things together. Eventually, you're going to have to go old school, and you're going to have to figure out the velocity of the satellite as it's orbiting around the Earth to figure out the translational energy as that thing is going around. Okay? It's going to tie together a whole bunch of different things. Now, one of the things you're going to do on uh, C, on number four, if each rocket expels gas, how many kilograms of gas are going to need? So on number four, C, you're going to go force times time, equals changing momentum. Now, here's what's going to be different because you're talking about a rocket ejecting out gas. That's going to be change in mass times velocity. Okay? So you got to figure out how much mass of fuel you have to burn through that's being ejected at this velocity to create that much force because you're going to know the time because you know the time is going to be five minutes. So what, you're going to know the force, you're going to know the time, you need to know the velocity, you need to isolate the change in mass. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. If that answer is right, it's going to be in the mid-teens. Okay, you're going to be in the mid-teens. Uh, number five is going to be a problem like we just kind of worked up there on the board. You have a solid cylinder, known mass, it's going to roll down. You got a radius of five centimeters, they're off to the races. So, I'm done, you're on your own. Have fun. Yeah. Uh, can I close your bike No. That doesn't sound is, like a good idea. Is that the one that... Course, uh, because number one, it's horribly expensive. Number two, bad things are going to happen. Where's the fluid out? The what? The fluid. Uh, the the ferrous fluid. Yeah. <laughs> is that the one that... Uh, mm. Sorry, Doc, you are explaining that assignment. Mm. I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. Was that the one that Ben got you? Yeah. What do you have, vocab? Okay? Uh, in foreign words, phrases. Uh, you have what? Foreign words, words and phrases. Oh, is this like Jeopardy? Yeah. Okay, foreign words and like, phrases. For yes. Yeah. So like coup d'etat? We haven't had that yet. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so, so yeah. Are carded long? Is that good? Yeah. A G's. You know what sucker means, right? Not exactly. exactly. I just know that it's an exclamation of surprise. Special words. Oh. oh, really? Cool. Angst. Angst? Yep. That's on that list? The German word. Like two shays on the. Uh, double entendre. Schadenfreude. Okay. Enjoyment or test the pain and suffering from others. Burke here, I think you're a shade and Freud. Huh? I think you're a shade and Freud. Perhaps that's from the pain and suffering of others. Yeah, I should probably do that. Of course I do. Look what I teach. You think he's a sadist. Oh, wait. 